Thank you very much. We may all be seated now. His Excellency President Cyril Ramaphosa, His Excellency President Lula da Silva, His Excellency Prime Minister Narendra Modi, His Excellency Minister Wang Wentao, representing President Xi Jinping, Her Excellency Dilma Rousseff, President of the New Development Bank, His Excellency Deputy President Paul Mashatile, may I warmly welcome the Excellencies to this closing session of the BRICS Forum. Today the business community met and we will receive a report on the discussions shortly. The discussions that dealt with the substance of the business forum. We will thereafter have the keynote addresses by the excellencies. Those remarks will be the main cause of the meal that we are about to serve. I will therefore confine my remarks as an appetizer to those addresses. I am reminded, dear friends, that it is through trading, through travel, and through dialogue that friendships and lasting relationships are built. And it is remarkable how connected our people, our histories, and our economies in BRICS are. We have more than 2,000 years of trading history between Asia and Africa, with trade delegations reportedly sent by the African pharaohs to India in the age of Ptolemy. More than a thousand years ago, there was a community of people who lived in this, the southern part of the African continent, near the banks of the Limpopo River. They were manufacturers and traders. They were artists crafting the golden rhinoceros. They traded with the outside world, with India, Arabia, and China, selling ivory and gold, buying pottery from China and glass beads from Persia. They were the people of Mapungupwe. They traded with China during the Song Dynasty. Later, during the Ming Dynasty, the great admiral, Zhong He undertook voyages of discovery with a fleet of 300 ships and 28,000 crew, which traveled to the eastern part of the African continent. And they saw the great African trading cities of Sofala and Mogadishu and Mombasa, Africans trading with the world. The age of colonialism saw the first European settlements in South Africa as a refreshment station for the ships en route to India and the Spice Islands of Indonesia. Our histories converged as large land masses were colonized. Indian enslaved people were brought from the Malabar coast to South Africa in the 1600s and 1700s. And later in the mid 1800s, large numbers of Indian indentured laborers were brought to develop South Africa's sugar our sugar industry, leaving a permanent mark in our demographic mix. And Mahatma Gandhi cut his political teeth here in South Africa. The age of colonialism saw to the start of the industrial scale, transatlantic slave trade, taking captured Africans across the waters in cram ships. And the modern state of Brazil emerged from that continent of the civilization of the Aztecs, the Mayas, and the Incas. And the spirit of Africa is alive in Brazilian culture, the warmth of its people, the music, and the samba that had its origins in Angola and Congo. And Russian history too contains connections. The great Russian writer Alexander Pushkin's great-grandfather was an African. Ibrahim Petrovich Ganibal, abducted from Cameroon, taken via Constantinople, and eventually taken to Russia, where he became a nobleman. 
During the struggle against apartheid, many South Africans stayed in Russia, in China, uh, in India, and as with many other parts of the world, we receive material assistance in the struggle for freedom in our land. And so we are connected by history, but not only by history. Today we look forward to matters relating to the future. Today's event is held in this, the industrial heartland of the African continent, an economy with major industrial strengths in traditional sectors, but also with technologies in the space and satellite economy, in the digital sector, in new green technologies, in advanced manufacturing. Ladies, gentlemen, friends, a major industrial exhibition is being held nearby at Gallagher Estate, showcasing products from more than 240 firms with 20 other African countries participating together with the five BRICS partners. I urge those who have not been there, visit it. We held a manufacturing forum which provided a platform for discussion on green industrialization, on electric vehicle and battery production, playing to Africa's strengths in critical minerals. Excellencies, today the business community spent the full morning in deep discussion about investment, about trade, and about technical cooperation. It is my pleasure, therefore, to invite Mr. Sim Shabalala, the CEO of the Standard Bank Group of South Africa, to summarize the main outcomes and give his reflections. And I invite Sim to take the podium. Please, you have the floor. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Minister, for that kind introduction. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's a tremendous privilege to present this high-level feedback on the BRICS Business Forum 2023. Today, guided by its theme of making accelerated growth and sustainable development a reality, the BRICS Business Forum has held sharply commercial and highly dynamic sessions attended by entrepreneurs, policymakers, business people, and indeed academics from across a number of the member countries and beyond. Talking of commercial dynamism, as the minister has alluded, it is very fitting that the BRICS Business Forum has taken place right here in Santon, here in Johannesburg, the capital of Gauteng, Gauteng generates about 35% of South Africa's GDP, and a large proportion of that is generated right here. And it is generated by South Africa's sophisticated and successful large corporations, medium-sized enterprises, and indeed SMEs. This year, for instance, Standard Bank's analysts think that South African listed equities will deliver average earnings per share growth of between 15 and 20%. To put it in perspective, other emerging markets are looking at minus 3% for the same period. And talking of South African corporations, relationships, travel, history, and trade, in the words of Minister Patel, I had the good fortune, ladies and gentlemen, and great honor of speaking this morning on a panel with Chairman Chin of the State Grid Corporation of China, as well as Mr. Ricardo Santon, President of the Brazilian Association of Animal Protein. They spoke about climate change and renewables. Words cannot describe the profundity of that moment. As it happens, it was a South African bank, my employer, the Standard Bank Group, which was the sole financial advisor to the State Grid Corporation of China in its 1.8 billion rand acquisition of 100% ownership of seven power transmission companies in Brazil in 2010. I mention this admittedly because it illustrates that South African corporate expertise and connections are an important part of making BRICS into an ongoing commercial reality. South Africa certainly has its fair share of challenges and I would rate unemployment and inequality as the deepest and worst of these. The wealth of Santon is within easy walking distance of the deep poverty of Alexander, a painful contrast 
that can be found in all of the BRICS countries, but one that is also highly conducive to innovation in the service of inclusion. For instance, to South African ears, the Brazilian financial services innovations that we heard about today sounded all too familiar. So there are serious challenges here in South Africa, but we also have immense strengths and competitive advantages. As well as the corporations that I've mentioned, these strengths include a strong rule of law, which guarantees that contracts will be observed and that commercial disputes will be settled fairly. They include our freely floating currency, open capital account, extremely skillful and credible central bank, and deep and liquid capital markets. These guarantee that returns on investment are and will remain quickly accessible in the currency of the investor's choice. More competitive advantages arise from what a Chinese panelist called South Africa's celebrity products, Mr. President, which include rooibos tea, wine, and unique tourist experiences. This brings us to another of South Africa's strengths, which is South Africa's openness for the business and tourist traveler. People from all of our major trading partners enter South Africa either visa-free or with an e-visa. Further, liberalization of travel and greater encouragement of air links between the BRICS countries and our major trading partners is certainly warranted. Perhaps above all, South Africa's competitive advantage emerges from our well-developed trade and investment network with our fellow Africans. China is indeed Africa's largest trading partner. What is sometimes missed, however, is that South Africa is the second largest exporter to the rest of our beloved continent and its fourth largest import partner. Of course, investors from the BRICS and worldwide do very much want to buy into Africa, given our continent's uniquely favorable demographics, immense natural resources, potential for low-cost industrialization, and increasing market integration under the Africa continental free trade area. For all these reasons, according to the IMF forecasts and on current trends, it is likely that Sub-Saharan Africa will be the fastest growing region of the world by 2030. Standard Bank's analysts foresee that intra-Africa trade could double under the AFCFTA and that there would be a $3.4 trillion investment opportunity in Africa infrastructure emerging from this rapid growth. The bottom line is simple. If investors from BRICS and worldwide want to buy into Africa's enormous growth potential, the place to start is right here in the square mile of Santon. Today's discussions have examined current intra-BRICS trade and investment trends and explored tangible solutions to unlocking further trade and investment opportunities in the BRICS nations and worldwide. Given that the BRICS nations are agricultural powerhouses, agricultural production and trade were discussed in detail with many useful comparisons, contrasts, and cross-learnings emerging. Participants were firmly of the view that much room exists for improvement across the BRICS nations regarding agricultural trade and market access. The same is true of Africa in general. Given the investments and the right policy environment, Africa can become the breadbasket of the world during this century what Mr. Mazepa called the African century. Another important topic was the just transition. A participant argued, a just transition refers to shifting towards a sustainable and inclusive economy characterized by both social equity and environmental sustainability. Renewable energy is an enormous opportunity for public sector collaboration and private sector investment and trade right across the BRICS and beyond. The theme of entrepreneurship featured strongly. A vibrant SME sector is often the most efficient way to create jobs. 
and some SMEs become unicorns and even mighty multinationals such as BYD and Tencent of China. Of course, for this to happen, countries need favorable business environments, strong education systems, and the appropriate financing institutions. Participants further argued that opening up market access to entrepreneurs across all BRICS presents an exciting opportunity to foster trade and job creation. And this, align, and this again highlights the value of strong travel links and appropriate visa regimes. Within the general theme of entrepreneurship, there was much discussion of the role of fintechs, an area in which BRICS countries have already established a great deal of expertise and success. On finance, for SMEs, participants pointed out correctly that startups are particularly vulnerable to sudden and sharp increases in interest rates. One of the roles for DFIs, therefore, is to provide concessional and patient capital for promising SMEs. Two essential preconditions for a financial system that is able to support both micro-enterprises and lower-income households are the democratization of data and universal access to a stable and credible form of identification. India has led the developing world on both access to data and ID, as has Brazil. In Africa, Kenya's rapid and sustained growth has also been powered by a significant pioneering use of mobile phone to create universal access to finance. The forum discussed the international payment system in some detail. From an African point of view, a highlight of this conversation was the discussion of the Pan-African payment system, payment system, which has immense potential to stimulate trade and growth by increasing the spend and certainty and reducing the costs of cross-border payments in Africa. Participants also debated the question of whether, whether a BRICS currency is possible or even desirable with strong views expressed both for and against, with little consensus being reached. Seen from a banker's perspective, the debate would probably progress more fruitfully if the discourse maintained a sharper conceptual distinction between international payments on the one hand and reserve currencies on the other. For example, and as the example of the PAPS illustrates, under certain circumstances, it may be possible to simplify international trade and the attendant payments using a collection of domestic currencies without any reference to any international reserve currency. It's also important to be realistic about the necessary characteristics of an international reserve currency. These include being a currency issued by a central bank with very high credibility in the implementation of monetary policy being the currency of a state or supranational entity with an equally strong track record of fiscal policy and meeting its debts, being freely available in large quantities in many jurisdictions, and full convertibility at all times. This set of characteristics cannot be quickly wished or agreed into existence, but can only emerge over a multiple of years as a track record of impeccable credibility and very wide use is built up. Finally, the forum also heard of the pleasing progress that is being made in institutional development, setting up sector-specific work streams which allow for concentration and focus on areas of common interest in infrastructure, manufacturing, energy, and financial services. In conclusion, today's discussions have been a very useful step in further unlocking the immense potential for trade and investment amongst the BRICS member countries. Thank you ever so much for your attention. I'd like to thank uh, Sim Shabalala for that report on behalf of the business community. I'd also like to welcome a large number of esteemed uh, guests and delegates, members of cabinet from a number of different countries, heads of the BRICS Business Council chapters, ambassadors and high commissioners. 
It's now my pleasure to invite the President of the Republic of South Africa, our host, who has inspired us with a vision of Africa and her place in the world. Please welcome His Excellency, President Cyril Matamela Ramaphosa. Thank you, Program Director, Minister Ibrahim Patel, Your Excellency President Luis Lula da Silva, Your Excellency Prime Minister Narendra Modi, Honorable Ministers and Business Leaders, and Your Excellency President of the New Development Bank, Ms. Dilma Rousseff. I greet you all, and it's a great honor to have this opportunity to participate in this leader's session of the BRICS Forum. I particularly want to thank Mr. Sim Chabalala for the report that he has just given and particularly underline and appreciate the message that is coming from all of you as business leaders about the immense opportunities that you see in investment across the BRICS countries. The BRICS group of countries exists not only to strengthen government-to-government relations, but also to forge stronger ties between the peoples of our five nations. It is for this reason that several bodies have been established since the BRICS was formed to enable cooperation across society, be it in business, be it in political parties, be it in the social sector and also in the sporting sector. The BRICS Business Council is a vital and vibrant platform for strengthening economic ties between our respective countries and in forging common perspectives on inclusive economic growth and development as we have heard from the report that has just been tabled by Mr. Chabalala. The changes that have taken place in BRICS economies over the past decade have done much to transform the shape of, glo of the global economy. Together, the BRICS countries make up a quarter of the global economy. They account for a fifth of global trade and are home to more than 40% of the world's population. This agglomeration of these five countries has a major impact on various aspects of the global activity and life. As we celebrate the 15th anniversary of BRICS, trade between BRICS countries total some $162 billion last year. Foreign investment has played an important role in the growth of BRICS economies. Total annual foreign direct investment into BRICS countries is four times greater than it was 20 years ago. However, the new wave of protectionism and subsequent impact of unilateral measures that are incompatible with WTO rules undermine the global economic growth and development. We therefore need to reaffirm our position that economic growth must be underpinned by transparency, by inclusiveness, it must be compatible with a multilateral trading system that supports a developmental agenda. The 
the type of developmental agenda that the five countries that are members of BRICS have embraced right from the onset. We require a fundamental reform of the global financial institutions so that they can be more agile and responsive to the challenges facing developing economies. In this respect, the new development bank established by BRICS countries in 2015 is leading the way. Since its formation, it has demonstrated its ability to mobilize resources for infrastructure and sustainable development in emerging economies without conditionalities. Earlier before coming into this session, I was speaking to the president of the New Development Bank and she was outlining to me how ready and willing the New Development Bank is in terms of supporting the development agendas of various countries. And we applaud this and we appreciate this. BRICS economies have emerged as powerful engines of global growth. Yet the rapid economic, technological, social changes underway create new risks for areas such as employment, equality, as well as poverty in many of the BRICS countries. It is quite heartwarming to hear you as business people, as one listened to Mr. Chabalala's report, also focusing on issues such as poverty reduction and elimination and inequality as well. It isn't often that you hear such very positive and forward-looking messages from the business community. So it's wonderful to be in a forum under the ages of BRICS that you as business leaders are in tune with the developmental agenda that needs to be pursued to lift the people who live in BRICS countries and beyond out of the ravages of poverty and inequality. We therefore call on the business community to join hands with us to identify solutions to these and many other challenges affecting our respective economies. From a South African perspective, there is massive untapped potential for investment in our country and indeed on the African continent as well. In recognition of this potential, the theme for this 15th BRICS Summit is BRICS and Africa Part BRICS and Africa, the Partnership for Mutually Accelerated Growth, Sustainable Development, and Inclusive Multilateralism. Africa is a continent of great opportunity in industrialization process in a variety of sectors. This continent is rich in the critical minerals that will drive business success in the 21st century. The continent has resources of lithium, vanadium, cobalt, platinum, palladium, nickel, copper, rare earth minerals, rhodium, and many others. And these are the minerals that are bound and are driving economic activity across the world. African countries have made it clear that the investors of choice are those who will come and invest in our continent, but also process the resources here close to source so that African countries do not export rock and sand, but export finished products as we would like to do. We are developing stronger regional value chains that will connect a number of African countries 
providing investors with diversity, with strength, as well as with resilience. The African continental free trade area creates a single market that is expected to grow to 1.7 billion people and nearly $7 trillion in consumer and business spending by 2030. The success of the African continental free trade area will require a massive investment in infrastructure. We need to mobilize the substantial financing that is needed to build the roads, the ports, the rail, the energy and telecommunications network that will enable industrialization and trade. It is also pleasing to hear that you as the business community, you also see this area as opportunities that you can invest in. Growth in African economies will be driven in the main by small and medium enterprises. This requires focused as well as effective support to these businesses. It is important that specific financing be directed also to women-owned businesses so that they can harness the benefits of the continental free trade area. And we in Africa, as we seek to grow and develop, we are focusing on the empowerment of the women of our continent who have been held back through the years of colonialism and in our case through the years of apartheid through protocols and laws and we are saying we need to free the women of our continent so that they can trade so that they can be in business and grow the economies of our various countries. Africa has a young, digitally connected and urbanizing population. A population which provides a stable workforce for companies in the future. The investment in skills development is continuing to grow. These factors all position Africa as the next frontier of productivity and growth. The BRICS countries have an opportunity to contribute to and participate in Africa's growth story. This can be achieved through greater cooperation in areas such as infrastructure, agriculture, manufacturing, new energy, and the digital economy. I was pleased to hear that these are also areas that you as business people are focusing on. South Africa has an important position in growing the African market, facilitated by the Africa continental free trade area and other free trade agreements. South Africa's industrial strength, our mineral endowments and our large market opportunities provides a compelling value proposition for companies wanting to establish their businesses here. South Africa has significant industrial capacity with Africa's most advanced industrial innovation and fabrication base. Firms that have invested here recognize that South Africa has deep local capital markets and strong financial systems. We have a diverse and sophisticated economy, and this country possesses world-class infrastructure, <clears throat> skills, abundant natural resources, industrial clusters, and a host of incentives to support investment. And many investment and partnership opportunities exist in renewable energy, in infrastructure, in aquaculture, in ICT, automotives, pharmaceuticals, 
and advanced manufacturing amongst others. It is clear from the report that we have just received that this has been a very productive business forum. And I'd like, as I end, to commend the BRICS Business Council, the respective ministers from the BRICS countries <clears throat> and officials, and all business leaders who have made a meaningful contribution for the success of this business uh, forum and to have all of you, almost 1,500, I'm told, to have this, what I see as a very successful business forum. I sincerely hope that your participation in this BRICS business forum will yield the productive outcomes that are required for us to catapult BRICS economies towards a more equitable and accelerated growth. In two hours or so, the BRICS leaders will sit together in a retreat to discuss a number of BRICS-related matters. And one of those is the expansion of BRICS. A number of countries, some of which are represented here, have, are seeking to be part of this BRICS family. And we appreciate that. It goes to show that the BRICS family is growing in its importance, in its stature, and also in its influence in the world. And we will be taking into account the various desires of various countries to be part of BRICS. So we hope to take into account the report of your discussions here as well as we consider the way forward with BRICS. Your participation here really strengthens the BRICS story. It confirms that BRICS is an important player in the geopolitical and economic architecture of the world. And so we hope that it will continue to be so. Thank you very much for participating. We thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, for those remarks. It is now my pleasure to invite the President of the Federative Republic of Brazil, his Excellency President Lula da Silva to take the podium. Please join me in welcoming the President. Gostaria de cumprimentar o Presidente Ramaphosa Presidente da África do Sul, gostaria de cumprimentar os ministros, gostaria de cumprimentar a presidenta do, do novo banco cooperativo Banco CEF, gostaria de cumprimentar os empresários e as empresárias aqui presentes. E gostaria, sobretudo, de saudar o governo sul-americano pela realização desse fórum empresarial. Quero expressar a minha satisfação por compartilhar este evento com os demais líderes dos países dos BRICS. Agradeço também a todos os empresários e empresárias presentes, em especial a direção do Conselho Empresarial, que completa 10 anos. O estabelecimento de parcerias entre os setores privados é uma dimensão muito relevante do BRICS e que dá vida e continuidade às relações entre países. Desde a primeira cúpula de chefes de Estado e de governo, nossa participação na economia global vem se ampliando. Já ultrapassamos o G7. Respondemos por 32% do PIB mundial em paridade de poder de compra. Projeções indicam 
que os mercados emergentes em desenvolvimento são aqueles que apresentarão maior índice de crescimento nos próximos anos. Segundo o FMI, enquanto os países industrializados devem desacelerar seu crescimento de 2,7% em 2022 para 1,4% em 2024, o crescimento previsto para os países em desenvolvimento é de 4% nesse próximo período. Isso mostra que o dinamismo da economia está no sul global e os BRICS é sua força motriz. O estoque de investimento externo direto dos BRICS no Brasil cresceu 167%. O foreign uh, stock uh, increase 370% entre 2029 e 2029, e em hoje, quase 400 companies do bloco operam no Brasil. Depois de seis anos de estar still o Brasil ainda vai criar novos qualidade de novo, vai lutar contra a pobreza de novo e vai aumentar o income das famílias brasileiras. Dois weeks ago, eu apresentei o novo pack. Growth Acceleration Program, the plan provides for resuming suspended projects, accelerating ongoing projects, and also selecting new projects. It is a comprehensive program with many opportunities that may be of interest of investors from BRICS countries. We hope to mobilize $340 billion for modernizing our logistics infrastructures with investments in motorways, railways, waterways, ports and airports. We will also give priority to the generation of solar and wind power as well as biomass, ethanol and biodiesel. We have immense potential for generating green hydrogen. We shall establish partnerships between government and the business community in all areas through concessions public-private partnerships and direct contracts. In order for investment to grow again and drive development, we need to ensure more credibility, predictability and legal certainty, as well as political and social certainty for the private sector. For this reason, I have advocated the idea of greater financial integration where we could have a new reference unit which would not replace our national currencies. The financing needs, the unmet financing needs of developing countries remains high. The lack of a substantial reform from traditional financial institutions limit the volume and the credit modes offered by existing banks. The decision of establishing the new development bank represented a milestone in effective collaboration among emerging economies. Our joint bank must be a global leader in the financing of projects that address the most pressing challenges of our time. By diversifying payment sources in local currencies, increasing its partner network and its uh, membership, NDB, constitutes a strategic platform to promote cooperation between developing countries. In this strategy, engagement with the African Development Bank will be central to this. At the multilateral level, the BRICS stood out for being a force that works in favor of a fairer, more predictable, equitable global trade. We cannot accept a green new colonialism that imposes trade barriers and discriminatory measures under the guise of protecting the environment. As of December, Brazil will hold the G20 presidency. The presence of three BRICS members in the G20 Troika will be a great opportunity for us to move forward on issues of interest to the Global South. We already have South Africa's participation, but the group's representativeness may be increased with the entry of the African Union and other countries of the continent.
is just a water break. I've been talking about developing and then suddenly, you know, I miss the main important source of life, water. Dear friends, upon taking office as president of my country, again, I am resuming the guidelines of Brazilian foreign policy. We started to rebuild South American integration. We have resumed our partnerships with the US, China, and the European Union. We hosted the summit of the Amazon countries. Uh, we still had to return to Africa. It is unacceptable that in 2022, Brazil's trade with Africa has dropped by one third when compared to 2013, when it was almost $30 billion. Trade flow with Africa still corresponds to only 3.5% of Brazil's foreign trade. Our trade agreement network is still in its infancy. Existing agreements with Southern Africa and Egypt date from my second term. Today, over 65% of Mercosur exports to Africa went to African countries with which there is no agreement in force. There is plenty of room to grow. In addition to a past that unites us, we also share a common vision of the future. In my first two terms, the African continent was a priority for Brazil. I have made 12 trips to Africa and have been to 21 countries. Brazil is back on the continent where it should never have left. Africa has vast opportunities and enormous potential for growth. To discuss the relaunch of trade with the continent, Brazil brought together the heads of the trade promotion sectors of all our representations in African countries here in Johannesburg last June. Africa is building an ambitious free trade zone project. 54 countries, 1.3 billion people with over $3 trillion in GDP in this continent, which is the youngest in the world from an age perspective and will be the most popular by 2100, offers countless opportunities for Brazilian products such as food and beverages, oil, iron ore, vehicles and iron and steel manufacturers. Africa has 65% of the arable land available in the world and it is has a strong vocation for being an agricultural powerhouse with the capacity to feed its people and offer global food security solutions. Combining investment and technology, Brazil has developed modern tropical agricultural techniques that can be successfully replicated in Africa. Through the Brazilian Agricultural Research Corporation, we have turned the Cerrado into an area of high agricultural productivity and we can replicate this experience in the African savanna. My government has also resumed public policies to support family farming, essential to fight food insecurity and hunger that affects our continent. The More Food program, which I relaunched last June, allows small farmers to have access to financing to purchase tractors, tools and harvesters. As in the past, a version of the More Food program for food should be resumed as another aspect of Brazilian self-self cooperation. Africa is also at the heart of the digital and energy transitions. Internet coverage already reaches most of the African population and digital innovation centers and financial technology services companies are multiplying, strengthening the Brazilian health 
complex strengthening may lead to ample opportunities for cooperation with South America. The African continent has important ore reserves such as, you know, essential ore such as lithium or cobalt that will play a strategic role so that we do not remain as exporters of primary products. We must make the most of this opportunity to forge an integration of our production chains and add value to the goods and services that we produce in a sustainable manner. Africa is the region of the world that emits the least amount of greenhouse gases. However, this does not mean that it does not have to face the most perverse consequences of global warming, such as droughts, floods, fires and cyclones. Brazil and many African countries have comprehensive plans to renew their energy mixes. We share the responsibility of caring for tropical rainforests and preserving biodiversity. We share the common concern of fighting the desertification process. Environmental and ecosystem services provided by rainforests to the world, they must be paid for in a fair and equitable manner. Social diversity products can generate jobs and income and offer alternatives to the predatory exploitation of natural resources. These are the pillars of the ecological transition plan that we will launch soon. For our economic and productive integration to flourish, it will be necessary to increase sea and air connections between the two sides of the Atlantic. It is inexplicable that we do not have direct flights between Sao Paulo and Johannesburg, Cairo or Dakar, essential for increasing the flow of people, trade and tourism. Therefore, I believe it to be very important the proposal made by the BRICS Business Council of establishing a multilateral agreement of air services for the group with the main national transport and aviation authorities from the countries. Very relevant proposal because the BRICS have a unique chance of shaping the global development path. You, business people, you're part of this effort together our countries make up a third of the global economy. This relevance will grow with the admission of new full members and dialogue partners. Collaboration between the public and private sector is vital for harnessing this potential and achieving lasting results. Thank you very much and good luck. Obrigado. I thank His Excellency President Lula da Silva. Our next speaker is the President of the Russian Federation, His Excellency President Vladimir Putin, who, while he's not able to be with us, will address us via video. I now ask that the video recording be started. <laughs> Dear President Ramaphosa, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I'm pleased to greet the government and business representatives, experts and industry specialists who have gathered to this meeting of the BRICS Business Forum. I would like to note that holding such business forums on a regular basis along with the systematic work of the BRICS Business Council, which brings together top businessmen and heads of major companies of the five countries, plays an immense practical role in promoting mutual trade and investments, enhancing cooperation ties, and expanding direct dialing among business communities and uh, thus effectively contributes to accelerated socio-economic growth of our states and achievement of sustainable de development goals. It is important that this forum focuses on such pressing issues as the post-pandemic economic recovery of the BRIC states, 
improvement of citizens' well-being, industrial modernization, development of efficient transport and logistics chains, stimulation of equitable technology transfers. These challenges and complex tasks have to be dealt with amidst the increasing volatility in stock, currency, energy, and food markets, coupled with a strong inflationary pre pre uh, pressures stemming from inter earlier the irresponsible large-scale money, money emission by a number of countries seeking to mitigate the effects of the pandemic, which has led to the accumulation of private and public debt. International economic situation is also seriously affected by the illegitimate sanction practice and illegal freezing of assets of sovereign states, which essentially amounts to the tramping upon all the basic norms and rules of free trade and economic life, norms and rules that not so long ago seemed Im immutable. Resource shortages, increased inequality, rising unemployment, and aggravation of other chronic problems of the world economy are the direct consequences. Prices for food, basic agricultural products, and crops have skyrocketed. And it is the most vulnerable poor countries that are hit hardest. Importantly, and in this circumstance, the BRICS states have stepped up their interaction and our joint work to ensure economic growth and sustainable development brings concrete, tangible results. More and more joint projects are launched. Mutual trade is growing, industry contracts are expanding. Above all, our cooperation is based on the principles of equality, partner support, and respect to each other's interests. And that is what is the core of our association's forward-looking strategic course, the course that reflects the aspiration of the larger part of the international community, so-called global majority. The figures speak for themselves. Over the last decade, mutual investments among BRICS states have increased sixfold. The overall investment in global economy have doubled, and their total exports have reached 20% of the world exports. As for Russia, the trade volume with the BRICS partners has increased by 40.5% and reaching the record of 230, even more than 230 billion. In the first half of this year, it grew by 35.6% 30, as compared with the same period in 2022, and it reached 134.7 billion US dollars. I would also like to point out that the share of the BRICS countries with their population totally more than 3 billion people now accounts to nearly 26% of the global GDP. And our five countries are ahead of G7 in terms of purchasing power parity with 35.1% against 30% forecast for 2023. The objectives and uh, irreversible process of de 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 dollarization of our economic ties is gaining pace. We are working to fine tune effective mechanisms of mutual settlements and monetary and financial control. As a result, the share of US dollar export and input operations within BRICS is declining. Last year, it was only 28.7%. In fact, this summit is to discuss the detail, the entire range of issues related to the transition to national currencies in all areas of economic cooperation between our five nations. 
the new BRICS development bank, which has already become a credible alternative to existing Western development institutions, has a great role to play in these efforts. It is only natural that enhancing connectivity and creating new resilient transport routes has become a shared priority in cooperation between our five countries. In this context, the BRICS Business Council's initiative to elaborate modern intermodal logistics uh, solutions and develop railway transport corridors is of particular importance. For this part, Russia actively works to redirect its uh, traffic and logistics flows to reliable foreign partners, including BRICS states. Our flagship project in, uh, include uh, the Northern Sea Route and the new International North-South Transport Corridor. These two major transport routes aim to provide the shortest and most cost-effective trade routes to link major industrial, agricultural, energy hubs with consumer markets. With regards to the Northern Sea Route, I would like to emphasize that Russia has already adopted and launched a large-scale, multi-year plan to develop its infrastructure. We intend to build fueled terminals, hub ports, to ensure connections with the road and rail transport. Ice brick and fleet is expanding, first of all by commissioning nuclear-powered vessels that have no analog in the world. As for the North-South Transport Corridor, it will connect Russian ports of the, of the Northern Seas and the Baltic and with offshore terminals in the Persian Gulf and Indian Ocean, thereby providing opportunities to increase cargo transportation between Eurasian and African countries. Besides, this will cert certainly give impetus uh, to developing new industrial, trade, and logistics facilities along those routes. Russia stands for greater cooperation within the BRICS on reliable and uninterrupted supplies of energy and food resources to the world, to the world markets. We are consistently increasing supplies of fuel, agricultural products, and fertilizers to countries of the global south and making a significant contribution to strengthening global food and energy security, addressing acute humanitarian issues, and fighting hunger and poverty in the countries in need. All these issues in particular were discussed in depth at the recent Russia-Africa summit. For example, last year, trade in agricultural products between Russia and African states grew by 10% grew by and amounted to 6.7 billion US dollars. In January, June this year, it increased by another record 60%. Our country is and will remain a responsible supplier of food to the African continent. Russian grain exports to Africa amounted to 11.5 billion tons in 2022 and almost 10 million tons in the first six months of 2023. And this is despite the unlawful sanctions imposed on us that seriously hinder the export of Russian food products and complicate transport logistics insurance and bank payments. Russia is being deliberately obstructed in the supply of grain and fertilizers abroad, and at the same time we are hypocritically blamed for the current crisis situation in the world market. This has been clearly seen in the implementation of the so-called grain deal, concluded with the participation of UN Secretariat and initially aimed at ensuring global food security, reducing the threat of hunger, and providing aid to the poorest countries. 
we have repeatedly drawn attention to the fact that in a year under the deal, a total of 32.0 million tons of cargo has been exported from Ukraine, of which over 70 percent have uh, reached high and upper middle income countries, including the European Union, first of all. And only about 3 percent have gone to the least developed countries, less than 1 million tons. None of the terms of the so-called deal concerning the lifting of sanctions imposed on Russian exports of grain and fertilizers to world market have been fulfilled. Obligations to Russia in this regard have been simply ignored. Even our free transfer of mineral fertilizers blocked in European ports have been obstructed. In fact, this is purely humanitarian campaign that should not in principle be subject to any sanctions. With these facts in mind, since 18 July, we have refused to further extend the so-called deal. And we will be ready to get back to it, but to get back only if all obligations to uh, the Russian side are truly fulfilled. I have repeatedly said that our country has the capacity to replace Ukrainian grain both commercially and as free aid to needy countries, especially since our harvest is again expected to be perfect this year. As a first step, we have decided to graciously provide six to six African countries 25 to 50,000 tons of grain, uh, each with free delivery of these cargoes. Negotiations with the partners are going to an end. Among the priority lines of interactions, we see also further coordination of the approaches of the BRICS participants to on the subject of supporting small and medium-sized inter enterprises. This is an important part of the overall economic agenda of the Group of Five, which implies the assistance of the widest circles of citizens involved in business regarding the issues of administrative and tax regulation, digitalization, electronic commerce, and participation in the value chains. I would note that thanks to the state support programs, the entrepreneurs from the BRICS countries successfully adapt to the constantly changing situation in the global market. They find new partners, new sales channels, attract additional funding, and use more actively modern technologies. It is equally significant to continue to develop cooperation within the BRICS countries in the field of decarbonization of economy, reduction of man induced impact on the nature and adaptation to the changing of climate. Russia is ready to work jointly to promote more balanced approaches to the climate change in the international arena. Our country is consistently implementing the National Low Carbon Development Strategy. We plan to reach the carbon neutrality of the Russian economy not later than 2060, including through the introduction of technological innovations, modernization of infrastructure for access to affordable and uh, clean energy, conservation of ecosystems on land and sea. We believe that the implementation of the climate goals can be facilitated by a variety of technologies, including those that have been in use for a long time already, such as nuclear generation, hydropower, gas motor fuel. To sum it up, I would like to reiterate that the multifaceted partnership and cooperation within the BRICS is not only makes a significant contribution to ensuring sustainable, sustainable growth of our states, but also generally promotes the uh, uh, healthy global uh, economy and successful achievement on the global development goals and targets uh, well, by, uh, set by the UN uh, to fight poverty, expand people's access to quality health care, uh, eradicate hunger, and improve food security. 
Therefore, I'm confident that the BRICS Business Forum and Business Council will continue the creative work aimed at the improvement of contacts between the entrepreneurial circles of the countries of the Group of Five and uh, join implementation of mutually beneficial projects. In conclusion, I would like to invite representatives of the business circles to our countries to come, uh, of the countries to come to the Eastern Economic Forum in Russia that will take place in 10 to 13 September in the city of Vladivostok, where by tradition there will be discussion of issues that are of interest, including the business community of the BRICS countries. Thank you very much for your attention. Spasibo. I thank the President for his remarks. It's now my pleasure to invite the Prime Minister of the Republic of India, His Excellency Prime Minister Modi, to take the podium. Please join me in welcoming the Prime Minister. Excellencies, leaders of BRICS business community, my namaskar, good evening to you all. I am glad that immediately after arriving in South Africa, our very first engagement is the BRICS business forum. First and foremost, I thank President Ramaphosa for his invitation and for organizing this meeting. My heartiest congratulations and best wishes on the 10th anniversary of the BRICS Business Council. In the last 10 years, the BRICS Business Council has played a vital role in enhancing our economic cooperation. In 2009, when the first BRICS summit was held, the world was just coming out of a massive financial crisis. At that time, BRICS emerged as a ray of hope for the global economy. In the present times also, amongst the COVID pandemic, tensions and disputes, the world is dealing with economic challenges. In such times, once again, the role of BRICS countries is important. Friends, despite volatility in global economy, India is the world's fastest growing major economy. Very soon, India will become a $5 trillion economy. There is absolutely no doubt that in the coming years, India will be the growth engine of the world. And the reason for this is that India has converted crises and difficulties into opportunities for economic improvements. In the last few years, we have carried out reforms in mission mode, and these reforms have helped in continuously improving ease of doing business in India. We have also reduced the compliance burden. We have removed red tape and instead laid the red carpet. There has been a boost in investor confidence due to introduction of GST and the implementation of the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code. Areas such as defense and space that were considered restricted have today been opened up for the private sector. We have laid special focus on public service delivery and good governance. By leveraging technology, India has taken a massive leap towards financial inclusion. The maximum benefit of this has reached our women in rural India. Today, with one click, millions of people in India get direct benefit transfers. So far, more than $360 billion of such transfers have been made. 
This has increased transparency in service delivery and reduced corruption and middlemen. India has the cheapest per gigabyte cost. Today, in India, from street vendors to large shopping malls, all use UPI, that is, the Unified Payments Interface. Today, India is the country with the highest number of digital transactions in the world. Countries like UAE, Singapore, France are also joining this platform. There are several possibilities of working on this with BRICS countries also. The large-scale investment being done on infrastructure in India is changing the country's landscape. In this year's budget, we have kept a provision of approximately $120 billion for infrastructure. By way of this investment, we are laying a strong foundation for a new India of the future. Rapid changes are coming into effect in all areas of railways, roads, waterways, and airways. Today, in India, new highways are being constructed at a speed of 10,000 kilometers per year. The number of airports has doubled in the last nine years. We have implemented the production-linked incentives with an objective to promote investment and production with logistics costs reducing the manufacturing sector of India is becoming competitive. India is amongst world leaders in the area of renewable energy. We are taking active steps to make India a global manufacturing hub in areas such as solar energy, wind energy, electric vehicles, green hydrogen, and green ammonia. It is but natural that with this, India will become a huge market for renewable technology. <coughs> Today, India has the world's third largest startup ecosystem. There are more than 100 unicorns in India currently in areas such as IT, telecom, fintech, AI, and semiconductors. We are moving forward with a vision of making India make for the world. All of these efforts have directly had a positive impact on the lives of common people. In the last nine years, the income of people has increased approximately three times. Women's participation in the economic development of India has been significant. From IT to space, from banking to healthcare, women have worked shoulder to shoulder with men and are contributing to the country's progress. The people of India have resolved to become a developed nation by 2047. Friends, I invite all of you to be a part of India's development journey. The COVID pandemic has taught us the importance of resilience and inclusive supply chains. For this, mutual trust and transparency are extremely important. By bringing our strengths together, we can make significant contributions to the welfare of the world, especially the Global South. Excellencies, once again, I congratulate the leaders of the BRICS business world for their contribution. I also thank my friend, uh, President Ramaphosa, for his excellent arrangements for this meeting. Thank you very much. I'd like to, uh, to thank uh, uh, the Prime Minister, Danya Vard. Thank you. Uh, we now have a statement by His Excellency uh, President Xi Jinping, President of the People's Republic of China, which will be delivered by Mr. Wang Wentao, the Minister of Commerce of the People's Republic of China. Please join me in wel welcoming Minister Wang to make the statement on behalf of President Xi.
Thank you, Minister Patel. It is my great honor to read out the remarks on behalf of His Excellency Xi Jinping, President of the People's Republic of China, at the closing ceremony of the BRICS Business Forum 2023. Your Excellency President of Guatemala, Cyril Ramaphosa, members of the business community, ladies and gentlemen, friends, I wish to extend my warm congratulations on the success of the BRICS Business Forum in South Africa. Ten years ago here in South Africa, we BRICS leaders witnessed the birth of the BRICS Business Council. Since then, the Council has stayed true to its founding mission. It has seized opportunities to deepen cooperation, contributing to economic and social development of BRICS countries, and helping sustain global economic growth. Right now, changes in the world, in our times, and in history are unfolding in ways like never before, bringing human society to a critical juncture. Should we pursue cooperation and integration or just succumb to division and confrontation? Should we work together to maintain peace and stability or just sleepwalk into the abyss of a new Cold War? Should we embrace prosperity, openness, and inclusiveness or allow hegemonic and bullying acts to throw us into depression? Should we deepen mutual trust through exchanges and mutual learning or allow hubris and prejudice to blind conscience? The course of history will be shaped by the choices we make. An ancient Chinese thinker observed that following the underlying trend will lead one to success, while going against it can only cause one to fail. We humankind have achieved notable economic development and social progress over the past decades, and that is because we have drawn lessons from the two world wars and the Cold War, followed the historical trend of economic globalization, and embarked on the right path of openness and development for win-win cooperation. Our world today has become a community with a shared future in which we all share a huge stake of survival. What people in various countries long for is definitely not a new Cold War or a small exclusive bloc. What they want is an open, inclusive, clean, and beautiful world that enjoys enduring peace, universal security, and common prosperity. Such is the logic of historical advance and the trend of our times. Ten years ago, I made a proposition of building a community with a shared future for mankind, calling on all countries to build this planet we all call home into a harmonious family. In the face of high winds, choppy waters, and even treacherous storms, we in all countries need to uphold the correct views of the world, of history, and of our overall interests, and act to translate the vision of a community with a shared future for mankind into reality. We need to promote development and prosperity for all. Many emerging markets and developing countries have come to what they are today after shaking off the yoke of colonialism. With perseverance, hard work, and huge sacrifices, we succeeded in gaining independence and have been exploring a development path suited to our national conditions. Everything we do is to deliver better lives to our people. But some country, obsessed with maintaining its hegemony, has gone out of its way to cripple the emerging markets and developing countries. Whoever is developing fast becomes its target of containment. Whoever is catching up becomes its target of obstruction. But this is futile, as I have said more than once, that blowing out others' lamp will not bring light to oneself. Every country has the right to development, and the people in every country have the freedom to pursue a happy life. With that in mind, I have proposed the Global Development Initiative with the goal of promoting development for all by the international community and boosting the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. With the support of many countries, solid gains have been made in pursuing this initiative with cooperation flourishing in various fields. 
China will work with all other countries to speed up cooperation under the Global Development Initiative, strengthen drivers of global development, promote the reform of the World Trade Organization in a comprehensive and in-depth manner, meet common challenges together, and make life better for people across the world. We need to achieve universal security. Recent years have seen a turbulent world. Many countries and regions are plagued by wars and conflicts, and many people are displaced. Members of the international community share the pressing hope to eradicate the root cause of conflicts and wars and find a fundamental way to realize enduring peace and security globally. Facts have shown that any attempt to keep enlarging a military alliance, expand one's own sphere of influence, and squeeze other countries' buffer of security can only create security predicament and insecurity for all countries. Only a commitment to a new vision of common, comprehensive, cooperative, and sustainable security can lead to universal security. Last year, I put forward a global security initiative, and it has gained support from over 100 countries and international organizations. China stands ready to jointly pursue this initiative with all others. We should have dialogue and oppose confrontation forge partnership but not alliance, and pursue win-win outcome and oppose zero-sum game, and work together to build a community of security. We need to stay committed to exchanges among civilizations and mutual learning. One flower alone cannot make a beautiful spring. Only blossoming of a rich variety of flowers can bring spring to the global garden. Human civilization is colorful by nature. It is precisely because of their differences in history, culture, and system that all countries need to interact with each other, draw on each other, and advance together. Deliberately creating division with the assertion of democracy versus authoritarianism and liberalism versus autocracy can only split the world and lead to a clash of civilizations. I've put forward the Global Civilization Initiative, calling for promoting diversity of global civilizations, the common values of humanity, and people-to-people -people and cultural exchanges and cooperation. China welcomes all other countries to get involved in cooperation under this initiative. We should encourage different civilizations to bring out their best and flourish together. We should break barriers to exchanges and renew human civilization. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, as an ancient Chinese philosopher observes, change is the nature of the universe. The collective rise of emerging markets and developing countries represented by BRICS is fundamentally changing the global landscape. Emerging markets and developing countries have contributed as high as 80% of global growth in the past 20 years, and their share in the global GDP has increased from 24% 40 years ago to more than 40%. Just as a line in the Chinese poem reads, no mountains can stop the surging flow of a mighty river. Whatever resistance there may be, BRICS, a positive and stable force for good, will continue to grow. We will forge stronger BRICS strategic partnership, expand the BRICS Plus model, actively advance membership expansion, deepen solidarity and the cooperation with other emerging markets and developing countries, promote global multipolarity and greater democracy in international relations, and help make the international order more just and equitable. The gathering between BRICS countries and more than 50 other countries in South Africa today is not an exercise of asking countries to take sides, nor an exercise of creating bloc confrontation. Rather, it is an endeavor to expand the architecture of peace and development. I am glad to note that over 20 countries are knocking on the door of BRICS. China hopes to see more joining the BRICS cooperation mechanism. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, China stays committed to an independent foreign policy of peace and the building of a community with a shared future for mankind. As a developing country and a member of the Global South, China breathes the same breath with other developing countries and pursues a shared future with them. 
China has resolutely upheld the common interests of developing countries and worked to increase the representation and voice of emerging markets and developing countries in global affairs. Hegemonism is not in China's DNA. Nor does China have any motivation to engage in major power competition. China stands firmly on the right side of history and believes that a just cause should be pursued for the common good. At present, we Chinese, under the leadership of the Communist Party of China, are advancing the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation on all fronts by pursuing Chinese modernization. Chinese modernization aims to achieve common prosperity, material and cultural ethical advancement, harmony between humanity and nature, and peaceful development for a huge population. Chinese modernization has created a new form of human advancement and presented a new future of modernization. We hope that other developing countries can draw on the outstanding achievements of human civilizations and find their own paths to modernization in keeping with their national conditions. Achieving high quality development is a top priority in China's goal of fully building itself into a modernized country. We are committed to applying a new development philosophy and creating a new development paradigm. In the past decade, China has contributed more than 30% of annual global growth. This year, the Chinese economy has maintained the momentum of recovery and growth. China enjoys several distinct advantages a socialist market economy in systemic terms, a supersized market in terms of demand, a full fledged industrial system in terms of supply, and abundant high caliber labor force and entrepreneurs in terms of human resources. The Chinese economy has strong resilience, tremendous potential, and great vitality. The fundamental sustaining China's long-term growth will remain unchanged. The giant ship of the Chinese economy will continue to cleave waves and sail ahead. China will remain an important opportunity for the world's development. Our door is wide open to anyone who wants to engage in cooperation with us. As a supersized economy, China will remain firm in advancing high standard opening up. We will continue to expand market access, cut the negative list for foreign investment, and further open the modern services sector. It will steadily improve the business environment, provide national treatment to foreign investment and enterprises, foster a world-class market-oriented business environment governed by a sound legal framework, and build a globally-oriented network of high-standard free trade areas. We will continue to advance ecological conservation, accelerate the building of a beautiful China, actively and prudently move toward carbon peak and carbon neutrality, and pursue all-round green transition in economic and social development. Going forward, as it endeavors to achieve modernization for its more than 1.4 billion people, China will surely contribute even more to the global economy and provide even more opportunities for the global business community. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, a formidable mission is a magnificent and glorious mission. As long as we work in unity and strength and cooperation, we will not be intimidated by any risk or challenge on the way ahead, and we will surely steer the giant ship of human development to a brighter future. Thank you. Xi Xi, I wish to thank uh, President Xi Jinping for his remarks and to Minister Wang for delivering it on His Excellency's behalf. We've now heard the views of five heads of state, views representing more than 40% of the world's population. The Excellencies too have heard the reports from the business community of the discussion you have had today. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the close of this session. I want to thank very sincerely the heads of state, the excellencies, for the time, for the insights, and for the comments that they've made. The heads of state will leave the stage now and we say farewell to them as they proceed to their next meeting in what will be a busy few days. 
I ask that you join me in saying thank you to them as they take leave of absence from us. Right,可能还有一些。啊,一起大家注意。一起大家注意。啊,留在会场的人,我只是想告诉你们,非常非常感谢。as we come to the end of the proceedings for the day, we wish you well for the remainder of, uh, for those traveling, for the remainder of the period here at the BRICS Summit. Don't forget these translator headpieces must be left behind. And we pray, as we have said before, that great good will come out of this particular BRICS Summit, the BRICS Summit of 2023. Thank you.